Rare and dazzling beauties of diamond have remained as an object of strong desire throughout history, truly transcending time and culture. Kohinoor is one of the finest diamonds of the world. Back in 1849, when the British Indian forces captured Punjab, it was taken to their treasury. Kohinoor, this tiny diamond, is just the tip of the iceberg. Without the British rule, probably we would never would have been under the Jaminari system, consequences of which eventually pushed us towards the Pakistan movement. And if there were no Pakistan, probably we would have missed the opportunity of living life as independent Bangladeshis of which we are so proud of today. From that perspective, how systematically the British looted us that be of some interest to us and not to forget that we all collectively contributed to their riches and wealth. This is General Sarwar and you are watching Sarwar's Chronicle. Briefly, India's share of global GDP was 24% as they landed on our shore and as they left, it dropped down to 4%. Just because India was governed for the benefit of Britain. It looted as much as $45 trillion between 1765 to 1938, which is equivalent to 17 times of the current GDP of Britain. After defeating the combined forces of Bengal, Oudh and Delhi, by Major Hector Monroe in the Battle of Boxer in 1765, Treaty of Allahabad was signed between Ampiro Shah Alam II and Lord Clive. This treaty particularly gave the British East India Company the right to extract revenue from Bengal, Bihar and Orisha. This was basically the start of systematic depredation that followed. Immediately following the Battle of Policy, the Army and Navy of British East India Company received 2.75 million pounds, which is equivalent to 32 million in today's money. Besides, the company also received 3 million pounds annually from Mejafar. While serving as a clerk in Madras East India Company, Lord Clive used to get 5 pounds annually and another 40 pounds for other expenses. But as he returned to Britain, he carried some 4 million pounds with him that made him the richest man in the entire Europe. Besides, he also held a tract of land worth 35,000 pounds. The British exploitation can be divided into three distinct phases, of which the first phase is the merchant capital phase that is started in 1757 and continued until 1813. Initially, the Britain had nothing to offer in exchange of goods it purchased from India and therefore, every time they had to buy something in exchange of precious gold and silver coins. But as the Treaty of Allahabad was signed and they have started extracting revenues, so they had an opportunity to use those revenues instead of spending precious gold and silver coins. They purchased Indian products in low prices and sold those in the European markets at a very high cost. By 1750 and 1760, East India Company was able to take control of Bengal and South India by driving out other European contenders and established monopolistic trade. At this stage, they were able to send 33% of the revenue extracted in the form of goods to Britain. Rightly or wrongly, they could only think of profit, nothing else. Even during the 1770s famine, they increased the tax level so as to compensate for the reduction of agriculture produce that worsened the situation further. To support the rising industrialization in Britain, the siphon used capital to help the growth of industrial capitalism in Britain. Under the Delhi Sultanate and Mughal Emperor, the people had customary right over the lands. The emperors they used to deploy the tax agents to collect revenue in exchange of commission. But as soon as the Emperor Aurangzeb died and the Mughal Emperor started to crumble, particularly in the form of their control over the Jamindas, the Jamindas they have started acquiring land as their personal properties. And that was the time when the British arrived in India and they also thought that if the Jamindars own the 
land only then they can be held responsible for tax collection. Since then, the black Estonian concept of personal proprietorship in the form of Jamindari system was introduced in this region. Further to Jamindari system, in 1793, permanent settlement was introduced by Lord Cornwallis. For an extended period of time, the tax was fixed without any regard to any contingencies on the part of the peasants. Besides, huge revenues were used for the expansion of the East India Company territory for financing its uh, various expeditions for developing its military paying them salary in many other sectors second phase of exploitation which is also known as free trade phase that started in 1813 and continued until 1858 by this time the British manufacturers were able to acquire skills uh, for going into larger scale productions and the East India Company was no longer required to buy products for selling in the European markets. During this time, the British capitalist class became a so dominant factor in the British economy that they were able to achieve uh, blessings of the colonial administration including policy matters. In order to protect Manchester based textiles, they raised the levy as high as 70 percent. Thus, the Indians were forced to dismantle their industries and send only the raw materials and unmanufactured articles to Britain. Although the free trade as championed by Adam Smith never meant the free, free trade to be one-way entry, but the British free trade was only the entry of the British goods to Indian soil. The net result was that Manchester-based textiles flooded Indian market made out of Indian cotton. To enhance their profit margin, the British introduced the agricultural commercialization. This decision added salt to the peasants' injury who were already stuck hard by tax burden. It reduced the size of the arable land for major crops and thereby reduced the peasants' safety net. Under the new system, the peasants they had to cultivate jute, indigo, opium, tea, coffee, rubber, and many other things. Not only that, the English acquired land around the plantations and the merciless exploitation of the indigo workers in Bengal reminds us of the dreadful legacies. The pattern of exploitation completely destroyed the Indian economy by destroying the village community. Not only that, by disintegrating the village community or the union of village community with the industry that destroyed the Indian industry completely. Third phase of exploitation, which is also known as finance capital phase, that is started soon after the 1857 rebellion when the British government decided to transfer the power from East India Company to the British government when this phase of exploitation began. Around this time, other European industries, they succeeded in industrializing and they were looking for colonies and sub-colonies to source raw materials for their thriving industrial sector. To Britain, India was important and therefore it planned to explore India through a different form of exploitation. It is when the British started putting money in big projects with the help of farms, foreign agencies, insurance companies, banking sectors and so on. They have put in money in railway project, irrigation project, some bit of education to carry out with their new form of exploitation. Particularly, the rising debt in railway project was phenomenal, particularly when the East India Company transferred power to the British government back in 1858. The debt was 70 million pound that rose to 224 million pound prior to First World War and after the Second World War, it rose to 884 million pound. Before World War I, 97% of the investment were made in road, transport, railway, telegraph, irrigation, and some bit in the education, essentially to serve the British purpose. The motive behind all these investments were focused in the penetration of India to convert it as a source of raw material and at the same time as a market for their finished product, agriculture. And in those days, most people, particularly 85% of the Indians, directly or indirectly relied on agriculture for their livelihood. They primarily produced rice and wheat using primitive know-how, 
still they lived a very self-sufficient and happy life. Under the Mughal rule, the peasants, they had to pay a nominal revenue of 10 to 15 percent, which used to provide a reasonable treasury for the rulers to run the administration and at the same time provide a wide safety net for the peasants to look after their contingencies. But East India Company abruptly raised the tax level to 50 percent in the name of suppressing rebellion. That was really hard for the peasants to carry on with their routine livelihood activities. Did you know that starvation alone caused death of 15 to 29 million in Bengal during the British era? Then came the permanent settlement, putting the peasants under triple burden. That is to say, East India Company, Jamindars and the money lender. And then often the peasants, they used to fail paying back the money lenders and eventually losing their lands. That's how the peasants class, they were becoming poor to poorer. Peasants subsistence base was completely ruined by the British agrarian policy. The resulting impact was reduction in the per capita food grain that came down from 167 to somewhat 137 kilogram per year within the gap of 30 years time I mean to say from first world war, world war to second world war. Thus Indian agrarian sector that once supported the Indian economy went into complete stagnation. Industrial sector? Indian industry was doing even better than the Chinese economy relying on not so modern industrial base but it's the British or the East India Company that ruined the Indian industrial base. Hence India was forced to turn towards Britain for products which were profitably made by British export and that earned them huge revenue and using those revenue and money they have purchased some strategic products like tar, iron, timber to be used in their industrial sector. Before the arrival of the British, the Indian handicrafts had very high demand across the globe and they were held in high regard. The destruction of these industries gave rise to high scale unemployment, but the British shrewdly resolved this unemployment problem identically born out of their faulty policies by employing these labors into tea, jute, rubber and other gardens which were owned by the white people. Until 18th century, India was the largest exporter of finished cotton products and it held its position due to low wages and abundant human capital. Article made up of wool, silk and cotton had a high demand both in the domestic and international markets. But these goods made with primitive know-how and techniques could no longer compete with the British products which were made out of powerful steam operated machines. Additionally, Various industries like marble industries, stone craving, leather and training, all these were severely hit. The development of railway project made East India Company or the British government to reach in every nook and corner of India and that really destroyed these industries lying in the far flung areas. India has been a major maritime power since millennia controlling all the key routes going through the Indian Ocean, controlling or facilitating more than 50% world trade. India had a large shipbuilding industry with an output of 2.23 tons annually between 16th to 17th century as opposed to only 223,000 tons annually produced in 13 different colonies in North America from 1769 to 1771. Emperor Akbar maintained ships for training purpose whereas Emperor Aurangzeb, he had a fleet of ships to be used for the for the pilgrims for traveling to Mecca for Hajj, and maritime uh, wing was an important element of Maratha King Sh Shivaji's defense and attack strategy. With the onset of colonization and invasion, the commerce or the commercial activity declined, and so is the shipbuilding industry. Dhaka produced the finest muslins and used to be shipped to the entire world but the British for making profit they have destroyed our looms chopped off, chopped off the fingers of the Muslim weavers so that they could no longer produce the same items and that's how the Dhaka Muslim and the Muslim ruined or disappeared. In World War One, 1.3 million Indian soldiers participated and the high demand of soldiers even brought 
children came to the battlefield as young as 10 years old they came to the battlefield to fight the germans and probably since then the culture of child labor took root in this region besides british sent 1.7 million elements 3.7 million tons of supplies including jute for sandbags and another 2 billion pound as loan to the british government of these participating soldiers around 75000s died 67000s wounded these men were by all count heroes but were destined to remain unknown as the war ended due to the deliberate british neglect and in world war 2 one little known fact is that it is the indian contribution that bailed out the west about 2.6 million indian soldiers participated in this greatest war in a very decisive moment that kept the british in the battle indian soldiers were dispatched to major war zones of the globe indian soldiers fought against the german tank divisions in africa they have driven out the japanese from burma they have participated during the invasion in italy and they have also had a very major role in fighting in battles in in the middle east of these participating soldiers around 87000 died in action equally critical was its material support that included the supply of foods and other war materials like arms ammunition defense stores sandbags jutes and other things field marshal claude ochin lake was commander in chief of british indian army in 1942 he asserted that british could not have come through both the wars if they had not had the indian support with this i am towards the end of my talk but i personally feel that these lord clives and the white mans were far better as they looted wealth from indian region to make their motherland rich and wealthy but look at the looters of bangladesh those who are piling up wealth in the foreign lands this is something as a nation we must ponder upon thanks for watching goodbye and a laugh is